In those days Mithros, son of Feanor, lifted up his heart, perceiving that Morgoth was not unassailable, for the deeds of Baron and Luthien were sung in many songs throughout Beleriand. Yet Morgoth would destroy them all one by one, if they could not again unite, and make a new league and common council. And he began those councils for the raising of the fortunes of the Eldar that are called the Union of Mithros. Hey guys, Yoiston here and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we will finally be continuing our Timeline of Arda series, where we talk about the major events in the timeline of Tolkien's works. And today we will be going all the way to the end of the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, the fall of High King Fingon, son of Fingulfin, and the capturing of Horin, father of Turin, by Morgoth. Ultimately, I foresee there being two more episodes of the Timeline of Arda series in the First Age after this one, and then we will move on into the Second Age. This video and the next two will individually include one of the great tales each, and by that I mean that this one will cover the main story and major points in Baron and Luthien, while the next covers such points in The Children of Horren, and the final one, The Fall of Gondolin. However, we will not go into too much depth on those stories here, as I have covered each of the great tales as told in the Silmarillion in their own separate videos. I'll link the Baron and Luthien videos, as well as some other related articles and videos in the description and cards above. If you haven't caught up on our timeline of Arda series up to this point, I'll link the first and latest episodes as well, as it may be quite confusing if you're not caught up. These stories come from the Silmarillion, so please check that out. With all of that said, let's begin our tale. We will begin our tale in Dorthonion in the year 460 of the First Age, after Fingon, Círdan, and Húrin of the House of Hador pushed back the Orcish assault on Hithlim in the far northwest of Beleriand. But indeed, we come now to the forest where dwelt Barahir of the House of Behor and his kin, who are outlaws. All of these outlaws would be slain by Sauron's orcs, save Baron, son of Barahir. We are now in the events of Baron and Luthien, which I will quickly summarize here. Again, links for the more in-depth tale are in the description and cards above. Ultimately, Baron acts as a sole outlaw in Dorthonion, until he is driven southwards into Doriath, where he meets Luthien, daughter of Thingol. Eventually he goes on the quest for the Somaril, given to him by King Thingol for his daughter's hand in marriage. To do this quest, Baron uses the Ring of Barahir and the oath that Finrod made to his father Barahir of aid and friendship to recruit the help of the elven king of Nargothrond. After the leaving of Finrod, there is political factionalization and social turmoil in Nargothrond until the sons of Feanor, Kurufin and Kelegorm leave, and Orodreth, the kin of Finrod, is recognized as the new steward and, after the death of Finrod, king of Nargothrond. They go north and are captured by Sauron on his Isle of Werewolves, where had once been the first dwelling of Finrod. Finrod and his small company of elves are slain, but Baron survives and is saved by Luthien and the Hound Huon of Valinor, and Sauron goes afterwards to Dorthonion, now named Tower Nufuin. Baron and Luthien walk free, but Baron remembers his oath, and after an encounter with Kurufin and Kelegorm, Baron goes northwards by himself, and Luthien and Huon chase after him. The eldest sons went to Himring, where their eldest brother Mithros dwelt, as this was after their leaving from Nargothrond. Thus Baron and Luthien walked together afterwards upon this quest, and the two went to Engband and stole one of the Silmarils from Morgoth's crown. Now this is quite a large deal in the context of the Silmarillion narrative, as it shows Morgoth could be assailed, which will give Mithros hope to found his union among the Free Peoples later. But after the theft of the Silmaril, Karkaroth, the werewolf of Morgoth, bit the hand off of Baron and took the Silmaril within his gut, and he ran wild from the north. Baron and Luthien were saved by the eagles and taken southward, even as Thangorodrim erupted and they flew over Gondolin. Baron was healed and returned to Thingol with Luthien, where they told their tale and Thingol's heart was softened towards Baron and likely all men as well. Baron took Luthien's hand, but soon a darkness fell upon Doriath from the north, and the hunting of the wolf ensued, where Baron, Huon, Thingol, and some others went to hunt Karkaroth on the edge of the forest of Doriath. Huon slew Karkaroth, but he and Baron were both ultimately slain by the venom of the wolf, but the Silmaril was recovered. Luthien too fell into darkness, and she came to the halls of Mandos, where she sang a song of such sorrow, and Mandos was moved. He sought the counsel of Manwe, who best knew the will of Iluvatar, and in the end, Luthien and Baron were returned to Middle-earth, where they were to live mortal lives, and they went from Doriath to their own island in Assyriand, Tolgallon, the Green Isle, thereafter called Dorfern Iguinar, the land of the dead that live. 
With all of that said, the major points in the tale that affected the timeline and its factions in a major way were the deaths of Barahir and Finrod, for afterwards Dorthonion became inhabited by Sauron and men no longer, and Orodreth now ruled in Nargothrond instead of Finrod. Also, Tolsirion was no longer fortified by the free peoples nor the enemy, but it would allow for the easy passage of orcs in the future. One of the Silmarils was now removed from Morgoth and was in the hands of Thingol, which would spur more kinslings and the invocation of the Oath of Feanor and his seven sons later in the timeline. And of course, the recapturing of the Silmaril would enhearten Mithros, and likely the other free peoples as well, leading us into the next part of our tale. Mithros would devise a great alliance to push back Morgoth and his forces and assault them, for if the free peoples remained divided, Morgoth would destroy each faction of the free peoples. However, the shadow of the past was shown, as the union was not as great as it could have been, for the ill deeds of the Feanorians wrought little friendship between the sons and Nargothrond and Doriath. Due to the deeds of Kelegorm and Kurufin, Orudreth would not march forth, but a small company of his people defied him, led by Gwyndor, son of Gwilin, as he grieved for the capture of his brother Gelmir during the Dagor Bragolok, the Battle of Sudden Flame. Gwyndor and his elves would join under Fingon of the House of Fingurfin, the High King of the Noldor, and Gwyndor would be the only one of that company to return home, even after his capturing by Morgoth. From Doriath came only Beleg and Mablong, who would not be idle during such a time. And this was after Mithros and his brothers told Thingol to surrender the Silmaril, and he would not do so. Thingol gave the two elves leave to join, only if they joined Fingon and not the sons of Feanor. And then Thingol strengthened his borders, even as Kelegorm and Kurufin vowed openly that they would slay Thingol if they returned from war and he had not surrendered the Somaril. Mithros did not reply to Thingol's defiance, for he busied himself with gathering forces. To him came the Naugrim, the dwarves of Nograd and Belagost, and the Easterlings under Bor and Ulfang. This force would march with Mithros and his Noldor. In the west, Fingon, who was ever the friend of his cousin Mithros, gathered his forces. Under his banner would march his Noldor, the elves of the Falas, the men of the House of Hador under Hurin, and the men of the House of Haleth under the Lord Halmir and then his son Haldir, as Halmir passed before war came. And of course the few elves of Nargothrond and Doriath would also fight in this host. Tidings even came to Torgon of Gondolin, who shall play a part in this tale as well. Mithros made a show of his power too soon, however, for the orcs were driven out of all of the northward regions of Beleriand, and even Dorthonion would be free of them for a time and Morgoth took counsel and sent forth spies, for even some faithless men in Mithros's following served Morgoth. However, when all elves, men, and dwarves were gathered that could be, the plan was made. Mithros would draw Morgoth's armies forth over Enfauglith, and then Fingon would issue forth from the west and break the armies between the hammer and the anvil as it were, and they would use a beacon in Dorthonion for this signal. On the allotted day, the morning of midsummer, in 472 of the First Age, the trumpets of the Eldar sounded forth at the arrival of the sun. In the east were raised the standards of the Feanorians, and in the west, the standard of Fingon, the High King of the Noldor, stood tall. Fingon looked out from the walls of Aethil Sirion, and on the east side of Arid Wetheren was his host of the factions of the elves, hidden from the enemy. On the right were the host of the factions of men. Fingon, with the sight of the elves, looked towards the Thengorodrim, and saw a black smoke, and knew Morgoth accepted their challenge. But a doubt fell upon him, and he looked towards his friends in the east, wondering if he might see the dust of Enfauglith rise beneath the armies of Mithros. However, unknown to Fingon, in the east Mithros had been betrayed and delayed by Uldor the Easterlings with false warnings of assault from Engband. But hope came from the south for Fingon as elves and men in Fingon's host took up a call, for Torgon of Gondolin came unlooked for with an army of ten thousand strong elves of Gondolin. When Fingon heard the great trumpet of his brother Torgon, quote, The shadow passed, and his heart was uplifted, and he shouted aloud, Utulien Aure, Aye Eldarie, Ar Etanatari, Utulien Aure. The day has come. Behold, people of the Eldar and fathers of men, the day has come. And all those who heard his great voice echo in the hills answered, crying, Alta ai lome, the night is passing. End quote. But Morgoth, who knew much of the designs of the free peoples, had sent a great force, only part of the whole. 
towards Hithlum, and they had come far before they were seen. The Noldor wished to assail them, as their fury grew hot within them, but Hurin spoke against it and bade them hold, as Morgoth's strength was always greater than it first appeared. The signal of Mithros did not come and the host grew impatient, but still Hurin bade them hold so that the orcs might break upon them in the hills. But Morgoth's evil strategy came to a head when the orc host drew very close before the stream of Sirion, and his captains sent out riders with tokens of parley. They rode up before the outworks of the Barad Aethil, and they brought Gelmir, brother of Gwyndor of Nargothrond, who had been captured during the Battle of Sudden Flame. Gwyndor happened to be in the outworks and saw his brother, who had been blinded. The orcs said they had more such prisoners at Engband, and that they would deal with them when they returned, unless the elves made haste. Thus, the orcs violently mutilated and slew Gelmir and left him. The flame of wrath became madness within Gwyndor, who leapt on horseback with many riders beside him, and they rode forth, and they slew the heralds and went on deep into the host. And so the battle was joined. Quote, and seeing this all, the host of the Noldor was set on fire, and Fingon put on his white helm and sounded his trumpets, and all the host of Hithlum leapt forth from the hills in sudden onslaught. The light of the drawing of the swords of the Noldor was like a fire in a field of wreaths, and so fell and swift was their onset that almost the designs of Morgoth went astray." End quote. The army of Morgoth was swept away, and the banners of Fingon came before Angband. Gwyndor and his elves of Nargothrond even burst through the gate of Angband and slew the guards within upon the stairs, and Morgoth trembled on his throne as the elves beat upon his doors. But that company was trapped, and the elves of Nargothrond were slain, except Gwyndor who was taken, and Fingon could not come to their aid. From the secret doors in Thangorodrim, Morgoth sent forth his main host, and the west was beaten back with heavy losses. Thus began the Nurnaith Arnoidiad, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, on the fourth day of the war. The host of Fingon retreated over the sands of Enfauglith, and Haldir of the Haladin was slain, as were most of the men of Brethil. Then came the army of Mithros, and hope was renewed in the elves. It is possible that the elves would have won that battle had all of their armies proven faithful. In that time the orcs were nearly routed, but Morgoth unleashed his last powers, and Angband was emptied. From this third army came wolves, wolf riders, balrogs, dragons, and Glaurong, the father of dragons himself. Elves and men withered before him, and he drove the armies of Mithros and Fingon apart. Some say that Morgoth still would not have won, was it not for the treachery of men. As the plots of Ulfang were unveiled, many of the Easterlings fled with lies and fear in their hearts, but the sons of Ulfang drove in behind the sons of Feanor, coming near to the standard of Mithros. Maglor slew Uldor the Accursed, who led the Easterlings in this treason, and the sons of Bor, other Easterlings, slew the sons Ulfast and Ulwarth, before they were slain themselves. Then a host of evil men came up and assailed the host of Mithros, as Uldor had kept them hidden in the eastern hills. The sons of Feanor survived, and with a remnant of Noldor and Naugrim, they hewed out of the battle and escaped towards Mount Dolmed in the east. The Naugrim stood last of the eastern force, as they could withstand fire more than elves and men. With their terrible battle masks, they stood against the dragons. The dwarves assailed Glaurong, who struck down their dwarven king Azakal, who, with his last stroke, stabbed Glaurong in the stomach with his knife. And so the dragon fled, as did many of the beasts of Angband. The dwarves bore their lord away, and sang a dirge in deep voices. They gave no more heed to their foes, and their enemies let them be. But now we come to the slaughter in the west, as Fingon and Torgon were outnumbered three to one. Gothmog, the lord of Balrogs, came and drove a wedge between the elven hosts, and High King Fingon was surrounded. Torgon and Horin were thrust aside towards the Fen of Sarek. Fingon stood alone against Gothmog, until another Balrog came up behind him and cast a throng of fire about him. Gothmog then slew the elven king with his black axe. The battle was lost, and Horin bade Torgon go as within him was the last hope of the Eldar, and while he and Gondolin stood, Morgoth should know fear. Turgon said that Gondolin would not now be hidden long, and if it would be discovered, it would fall. Then Hur, Hurin's brother, said that if it would stand for but a time, 
a hope should come for men and elves out of Torgon's house, and even though Hur and Torgon would never meet again, a new star from the two would arise. Maeglin, son of Ewul the Dark Elf, Torgon's nephew, overheard this and would remember, although he said not. Thus Torgon heeded these words and summoned the remaining hosts of Fingon's people and his own, and they set out for a retreat. Ecthelion and Glorfindel guarded the flanks, and the men of Dor Lomen under the rule of Hurin guarded the retreat, and they did not wish to leave the north, and they would stand to the end if they could not win back their homes. The treachery of Uldor was redressed, and out of all of the deeds that the fathers of men did for the elves, the last stand of the men of Dor Lomen is most renowned among them. Turgon, who had once fostered Hurin and Hur and Gondolin for a time, escaped, and the brothers Hurin and Hur stood and slowly withdrew, until they came behind the Fen of Sarek with the stream of Rivil behind them. There they made their stand. The sun set on the sixth day of battle, and it grew dark. Hur was slain with a poisoned arrow to the eye, and the men of Hador were slain well about him in a heap, even as the orcs hewed their heads and piled them. Last of all, Hurin stood, and he cast his shield aside, wielding an axe two-handed. He slew the troll guard of Gothmog, and his axe smoked in black blood until it withered. He cried, Aure into Luva, meaning day shall come again, with every kill, and seventy times he uttered this, but in the end, they took him alive by the command of Morgoth. Orcs grappled him with their hands, even though he hewed their arms from them, but more came until he was buried beneath them. Then Gothmog bound him and dragged him to Angband. And so ended the Nurnaith Arnoidiad, the fifth battle, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Morgoth had won in more ways than one, for men had slain men, and elves were estranged from men not of the three houses of the Edain from that day forth. The realm of Fingon was destroyed, and the Feanorians wandered the wild, and they mingled with the green elves of Osiriand. In Brethil only some Haladin remained and Handir, son of Haldir, was their new lord. And to Hithlim never returned Fingon's host, nor any men of Hador's house, nor tidings of such lords. But Easterlings came there as a reward for their treachery against Mithros's host, and they harassed the people of that land and were shut in Hithlim. Orcs and wolves went free in the north, but Doriath and Nargothrond remained hidden and safe either because Morgoth knew little of them, or the time of his malice had not yet come for them. Many elves took refuge in the havens of the Phalas, but ere the winter of the next year came, Morgoth sent a host over Hithlem and Nevrast, coming down the rivers Berthon and Nenning, and they ravaged the Phalas, besieging Brithumbar and Eglarest. Even the tower of Barad Nimros was cast down, and many of Círdan's people were slain or enslaved. Some escaped by sea, such as Arenian Gilgalad, who had been sent to the havens after the Dagor Bragolach by his father, and the remnant of elves sailed with Círdan south to the Isle of Balar, making a new refuge for all that could come there. After hearing of this, Turgon sent more messengers to Sirion's mouths, asking for the aid of Círdan. At the bidding of Turgon, seven ships were built by Círdan and sailed west, and only one survived the storms of Asse, and was saved by Ulmo. He was Varanwe, and we will discuss him more in a future timeline video, as he was returned to Middle-earth. The thoughts of Morgoth now dwelt upon Turgon, the new High King of the Noldor and his city of Gondolin, for they eluded him, and out of all of his foes he most desired to take or slay Turgon. Morgoth hated the House of Fingolfin most, for they had friendship with Ulmo, and Fingolfin himself had wounded Morgoth. Even during their time in Valinor, Turgon had cast a shadow upon Morgoth, for he forebode that his ruin should come to him from Turgon. As we shall see with Turgon's grandson, Earendil, Morgoth had good reason to be afraid. Finally, Hurin was brought before Morgoth, as the Dark Lord knew he had friendship with the King of Gondolin. Hurin, the greatest warrior among men, mocked the Dark Lord, and so Morgoth cursed Hurin, his wife Morwen of the House of Beor, and their offspring, setting a doom upon them. Then he put Hurin in a high chair of stone upon the Thangorodrim, and with the eyes and ears of Morgoth, Hurin would bear witness to the evil and despair that should come to those whom he loved, until all was fulfilled to its terrible end. Hurin never asked for death or mercy for himself or his kin. By the command of Morgoth, his orcs piled the bodies of those who had fallen in the Nurnaith Arnoidiad into a hill, 
and it was called Hoth in Nindengen, the Hill of Slain, or Hoth in Nernaith, the Hill of Tears. But grass would come there alone in the desert of Morgoth, and no creature of Morgoth thereafter tread upon that earth, beneath which the swords of men and elves rusted. And that brings us to the end of our tale, at the end of the year 473 of the First Age. We shall pick up again in the next episode of the Timeline of Arda, with the major points and timeline of the tale of the Children of Hurin, and the ruin of Doriath. From today's tale about the union of Mithros, we see one of the greatest moments of sorrow in Tolkien's works, but we can still learn from it. It may be that the Free Peoples would have had victory against Morgoth if their people had stayed true to one another. We see what strength lies in friendship from Fingon and Mithros, and if we could be so loyal to others as they were, and avoid treachery unlike the Easterlings, we may see victory and joy in the end. Thank you all for watching this rather sad tale. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on the union of Mithros and everything else we covered in this video? Let me know your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections in the comments below. For me, while this is a sorrowful tale, it illustrates the terrible nature of betrayal and infighting among people, which is an ever-present theme in a contentious world. I do enjoy this story, and I especially love the moments of hope and glory within it, even if such moments are rare. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, please be sure to check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, merch, and Patreon for podcasts and Discord server in the description below. A huge thank you and shout out to our Valar tier patrons on Patreon, Adrian De La Tour, Chris Ortner, and Marseille. Thank you guys for the support, it really means a lot. I also wanted to give another shout out to the Extra Life Foundation, which is collaborating with Standing Stone Games, the company that runs the Lord of the Rings Online, to raise money for children's hospitals. It would mean a lot to me if you checked out their partnership and consider donating. It runs through November 15th. Also, the Lord of the Rings Online expansion Menace Morgul is coming out this week on Tuesday, November 5th, so please check that out too. You all know how much I love that game and I hope you guys check it out. Links for all of those are in the description below. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I will see you all again next week with another video on the differences between the Lord of the Rings books and movies, continuing our What's Different series with part one of The Two Towers. Everyone, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.